My special guest today is Douglas Kruger from South Africa. Now, Douglas, many of you would know him from his work in Toastmasters, from his uh, wonderful and continuous content that he puts out on YouTube and Facebook. But if you want to know more professionally about what Douglas does, uh, Douglas is the author of no less than eight professionally published books, commercially published. All his books focus on uh, organizations and leadership and industry and how you can actually own your industry. And the first book I actually bought of Douglas was How to Make Your Point Without PowerPoint, which is something I actually recommend wholeheartedly to anybody who is starting out as a speaker and wants to up their game in, in presentation skills. 2016, you were inducted in the Hall of Fame, right? And only last year you earned your CSP, your certified correct, speaking yeah. professional. Uh, but what I want to talk to you, Douglas, today about is about money. And money is a very tricky thing. So, Douglas, thank you for joining me on Imagineering, and thank you for doing this. Uh, it's only a pleasure. I've been looking forward to the chat. First of all, before I really start anything else, this has been bugging me for a while now. Did you have a voice coach? Do you, like, uh, did you go through voice coaching or, or what? I mean, it's like you've got this booming voice. No, what, even in a busy crowd, I can hear you speak. <laughs> what it is, is I've downloaded this clever little app and it's only because you're, you're hearing me through the screen that it sounds like James Earl Jones. If you heard me in real life, I, I lisp and squeak and it cracks and it's hitchy. Uh, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> I really do appreciate it. But, oh, uh, right. but no. so it's an app. It's not, it's okay. It's Please yeah, download I'll the James it. Earl Jones app because that's obviously what Douglas is doing. Yeah. He's got some sort of magic happening there. You didn't receive coaching. It's just all natural Douglas. Let's call it, let's call it informal study. I'm, I'm very interested in the use of voice, uh, just having been a speaker for the past 15 or 16 years. And I like to study how people like Jeremy Irons or James Earl Jones modulate their voices and how they achieve the effects that they do. But, uh, but no, no, no official or formal coaching. No official coaching. formal that's, coaching. That's okay. But what I really want to talk about is money. Money, right? People don't want to talk about money. I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, I tell everybody I'm poor, but you know, getting better. Uh, <laughs> but people don't want to talk about money. It's I don't know. It's a strange yeah. thing, and so I wonder now. Have you come across that? You know, when people don't like when you said blushing, right? When they talk about money, they blush. Yeah. Absolutely, because money is inextricably bound up with ideas of morality and ideology and so forth, and I think it is. On the one hand, you can understand why we are raised not to think of money as the great point of life. And, and that's, that's a very healthy perspective. There are much more important values, your family, your investment in yourself, and so forth. These things are infinitely more important than money. But that is not the same thing as saying that money is not important. Right. And a failure to generate money harms your family. We, we tend to perpetuate this idea that there is something very noble about being poor. If you've ever been poor, you know firsthand there is nothing noble about it. That, that is a fairy tale narrative. It, it, there's nothing worse than, as a small child, watching your parents fight about money or feeling that sense of anxiety that you don't know your place in the universe. Um, I grew up not in a desperately poor situation, but my family went through some very hard times when I was young. And the thing that always jumps out for me, it's kind of my little icon of, of what the insecurity of poverty looks and feels like. When I was about 13 years old, I had a young sister. She was about a year old at the time. And um, we were going through an immensely difficult period financially. And I can recall our local church delivering a food basket to keep us going. And in the food basket was a little box of baby formula. And I can remember being about 13 years old and looking at this box of baby formula and feeling this incredible mix of emotions that on the one hand, you feel so vulnerable. And on the other hand, you're grateful that someone is helping you. On the one side, you are resentful that someone has to help you. On the other side, you're grateful they do. And just that sense of feeling so insecure about your place in the universe. It is probably why I'm so interested in wealth literature and ideas about success today. It, it originates, and I'll say this quite openly, from a place of insecurity and a place of fear. So the whole topic of money is bound up in emotions, it's bound up in ideology, but the downside to that is we make the mistake of not talking about it around the dinner table. We come to the conclusion that it is inappropriate, and I think that is entirely the wrong way to look at it. 
I think the most effective families sit and have open discussions about wealth and about money and about finances, goals and aspirations, and they do it without shame and without qualms. Now, the fascinating thing about that, I don't think you have to have the right answers <clears throat> when you are sitting around a, a family table and, and discussing money. I think the discussion itself is the important part. And the reason I say that is that the answers change over time. Mm. As industries evolve, as thoughts about money change, as investing changes, the answers are going to change. So it's not imperative on us as, as parents, for example, to have the right answers, but it is important to ask the right questions and to have our kids asking the right questions and confronting these ideas. I think that's terrifically important. And you know what? I Now that I'm adult, right? Well, you know... I'm still childish, but you know, wow. you know, no, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, it's like one half a dozen of Yeah, people. you know, <laughs> I have to sort of like just make sure people know it. It's like I'm not, I don't act like an adult most of my time. But anyway, <clears throat> um, when I was growing up in school, right, the way they teach you about money is completely false and wrong, and it's like a fairy tale land sort of a thing. Um, you yep. know, you, you have to get a good job and then you need to save a percentage of that money yeah. and then, you know, uh, hopefully you get a nice interest rate and it's all like hopefully, maybe, possibly, potentially, yep. you know, all kinds of things. When I was an adult, you know, studying how to sort of like increase your your wealth, not 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 money per se, but, but to generate wealth, right? Because mm -hmm. wealth is something that shouldn't run out. Uh, money, mm -hmm. you know, tends to you've got money now and then you don't. Um, but when they teach you in school about money, what they teach you is not what the reality is. Because like, for example, yeah. in, in, in business, uh, in school, they would teach me that uh, for a product, right? You charge for, you take into account the basic cost of the parts. Uh, you mm -hmm. add labor cost, and then you add like 25% of the total and that's your profit margin. Yes. What reality yeah. tells me is like people will pay for something they perceive as valuable. So it's not uh -huh. the actual value, but the perceived value of something, right? I mean, and, and you've hit the nail on the head there. I mean, that, that is the heart and soul of what I've spent the last 15 years doing as a speaker and author. It's that concept of value. And there are many ways in which you can multiply your value. Let's take a couple of simple examples from our world as, as speakers and coaches. Mm. You, you, again, hit the nail on the head there. The issue of perception. If you are perceived to be a high-level person who gets good results, your fee is exponentially more than that of someone who works equally hard. So it is not tied to how hard you work. It is tied to the perception of value. But there are other ways of multiplying your value as well. I mean, just take the example of a YouTube star. You've got these young kids these days, I mean, this is fascinating to watch, mm. playing video games on YouTube, rack, ranking up millions of views and buying yachts with their proceeds. <laughs> now, there is no link between how hard they are working and how much they are earning. There, there's none right. whatsoever. What it, what's happening there is the multiplication of value. The idea of being entertained by someone watching a video game for an hour or two online may have X amount of value for one individual but times that by a few million individuals around the world and each YouTube video becomes worth extraordinary amounts of money. We saw that even outside of the digital world with someone like Charles M. Schultz, the, um, the author right, of the Right, Peanuts, right, yeah. Yeah, it's just fabulous. You go and have a look at Forbes' list of the um, wealthiest posthumous earners for the past few years, which is their fancy way of saying richest celebrity dead guy. And at number... <laughs> <laughs> Number three, you've got Charles Schultz. It's, if I remember correctly, it, it alternates every year between Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley. And at number three is Charles Schultz. Now, the man worked for an hour every day. But what he did was he drew this popular little, little comic strip that then sold to thousands of newspapers around the world, multiplying the value. So, yes, as you mentioned there, the ideas that we learned in school are the very basics of business. It is almost a cardboard caricature of what mm. can be done. It's the safe version, but it's one option and it's a disappearing option. We, we don't generally think that way anymore. These days, businesses tend to think in terms of multiplying and exponentially multiplying the value. And that's what we're after. Now, the next thing that schools teach, and this tends to hit the students and, and catch them off guard when they get to the high levels of, of high school and they start entering varsity, is the more socialist ideas around businesses, which basically have one flawed premise at their heart and soul, which is 
wealth is a finite pool and you come and take your little bit. And the implied thinking is that if a large organization is earning a huge amount of money, then it's taking a lot of that pool away. Now, the fallacy in that is that businesses don't take from a finite pool. They generate. And that's the part that we're interested in. If it were the case that there is a finite pool of wealth and all of the players come along and take their bit away from it, that would imply that at some point in time, all of the wealth that ever existed already existed. Mm -hmm. Yet, if you look at world economies, they are growing every year. So someone is wrong here. And I suspect it's the, the socialist teachings that we're perpetuating in, uh, at varsity level. And I think it's extraordinarily dangerous. It results in this idea of, of young people thinking that capitalism is inherently evil. And there, are, there are several problems about that. So, yeah, I had a talk with uh, a young lady in Durban, uh, also for the Imagineering series, about entrepreneurship, right? Where she said, mm. you shouldn't wait until you get inspired to be an entrepreneur, right? Start being an entrepreneur now. You don't have to yeah. wait for your passion or something like that. And I thought, it's like, you know what? The entrepreneur, the companies, right, who puts the most back into, into the country. They generate jobs, they generate health, all kinds of things, right? So where did you, you didn't start off as a financial sort of a guide. You started off more like a professional speaker, you know, and, and you got to where you were. And you, your yeah. first book, I think, was about speaking professionally. How did you turn that, how did you go from that path to, to finance? Yes, it's, it's a bit of an unusual path in the sense that most people who become professional speakers or authors start off as, as some degree of a star in something else. They might be a, a rugby star or a CEO or whatever the case might be, and then they become a speaker and, and author as a result. I did it the wrong way around. Um, <laughs> in high school, we had a Toastmasters group come and do a, a youth leadership course for us. And Toastmasters is the, the world's biggest nonprofit organization for public speaking training, as, as you know, as a member. And um, I just, I love this idea, being some, somewhat of an introvert, that I could prepare my thoughts backstage and then get out in front of people and deliver the best version of myself. And that just really appealed to me. After school, I joined a club, not knowing that they have things like a world championships for public speaking and not knowing that you can actually make a career and a profession out of it. And a strange thing happened. After entering a few of the contests, people started saying things like, could you come and do that speech for my company, my team, my group, my organization? And that was my introduction to this world, that there is such a thing as a paid professional speaker. And it put me in a very odd scenario where I had this viable speaking career, but very little to say. So I tried to approach that as ethically as I could. I, I did not attempt to stand up on a stage as a, as a 21 or 22 year old and give leadership advice to CEOs because you simply don't have the experience and it, it, it lacks authenticity. What I did was I began by speaking and training on the things that I knew best, which were public speaking, confidence, how to put forward the best version of yourself and simple ideas like that. Then over time, my own study, my own business growth, and so on, led me in naturally into the next books. The, the wealth one was a, was a logical one for me because it was something that I had struggled with my entire life. I came from a family that lived among relatively wealthy people, but we were the odd ones out. Mm. So I had this odd scenario where I could see both sides of that coin. I, I knew what the thinking was like among families that get caught in generational cycles of poverty and I could see the differences in thinking among people who became self-made millionaires, uh, ran their own businesses, and just led these economically self-sufficient lives. And to my mind, there was something valuable in being able to see where that diverges. This idea of, if you think this way, it takes you on this path. If you think that way, it takes you on that path. And as I've learned and, uh, and grown in various topic matter, I have then tried to turn that into books and speeches and so forth. And here I am some 16 years down the line, and so far it seems to be working. So far it seems to be working. Yeah, but I, I love the idea that, and in your talks especially, you, you tell people that stop equating money with hours of work, right? Um, stop exchanging yeah. hours for dollars, basically. Yes, uh, understand because, the value equation. The value is the thing that matters. Yeah, so sell the value of something, or at least the perceived value of something, not, don't focus so much on what the actual value is. For example, for me to do a, a course on, on leadership or something like that, or creativity rather, because that's what I speak on, uh, 
you know, it doesn't really take much for me. I mean, I have to do a lot of prep work and so forth, right? But I can do that in my free time. But you mm. pay for the value of what it is to you, right? It's not yes. the same as just paying for, for, for a speaker to speak an hour, which is why speakers get uh, to charge the amount that they do because they bring yeah. value, right? Yes. Uh, it, and the and idea it, is it's often relative to the, the cost of the problem you solve. So let's say, for example, you've got a leadership issue in your organization and it's costing you millions or your organization lacks creativity. And as a result of that, your direct competitor is eating your breakfast. That is not a small problem. That is an expensive problem. And solving it is not a matter of, of asking how much is your hour of teaching or consulting worth? It's a matter of saying, how much is this problem costing the organization? And that's mm. a different way of thinking. I love that is your competitor eating your breakfast? That's genius. <laughs> is that the next yeah. book? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I need, to, yeah right. I need to write yeah. that down. That's a Douglas Kruger quote there. Is your competitor eating your breakfast? I just love that one. Grab that pancake first. Say again? 50 ways to grab that pancake first. First thing, yeah. But speaking on that, a lot of your books has 50 ways. You know, 50 ways to do they this, 50 do. ways. Yeah. Why 50? The, the deep and philosophical reason for that is I did it for the first one and then kept going. <laughs> there you go. The first one was, um, was 50 ways to become a better speaker. And I just, I, I enjoyed the format. It, it was such a, a, a simple and in a way elegant way of writing a book because it gives you, you, you take all of the ideas you have, you break it down into units and then you build up each chapter. And it worked so well on the first one that I've simply kept going. So there are now all 50 ways to. Um, 50 ways to. My mind's eye, I picture a, a bookshelf somewhere that's very much like the uh, the dummy's guide or you know something down those lines ah. where it's your own shelf and it's the 50 ways series. I don't know, we'll, we'll see. But why not? I, I think that's doable. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're going to go for something, go big or go home. You know, that's, I think that's really true uh, because we, we aim for the lowest bar. You know, it's like I think too much. Yeah. Um, we set ourselves up. I think in one of your talks you say, you know, it's like I want to be – uh, or someone said that I want to be the assistant to Mick Jagger or something like that. You know, it's like, um, yeah. And it's like, and Bon Jovi said, I want to be Mick and then he expletive Jagger. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And right. one of the ways in which we actually fall for that as, as entrepreneurs, and I see this all over the, the show and I catch myself doing it too, is we benchmark locally. We ask ourselves, how good is the competition here? And I find increasingly that question is irrelevant and it is the wrong metric. If we are going to be talking in terms of value, Value means go for the highest version of, exactly as you're saying, and to go for the highest version of, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to know what the highest version of that is globally. And it is a fallacy to think that your customers don't know what the equivalent is in, in London, in LA, in Sydney, and all around the world. With the internet, with YouTube, and so forth, people who are looking at you are comparing you to the best in the world. If you're comparing yourself to the best in your country or the best in your city, that is a fundamental mistake. I did a workshop uh, a few months ago and I was comparing, you know, like you need to get your information from more than one source. So I compared uh, CNN with Fox, you know, CNN hates Trump, <laughs> Fox loves Trump. You know, it's like, wow. and I compared the two, yes. right? You and know, the phrase one, angels and demons springs to mind and I don't know why. <laughs> and it's like, look, I don't care if you love Trump or hate Trump. I'm just saying get your information from more than one source. I try to think global, not just local, right? Maybe customize it to, to the locals that you're speaking to. Absolutely. Yeah. Know your audience, right? But yes, and getting... I, think, I think the distinction there is you can take world-class content and world-class ideas and deliver it for that group. Right. But that's not quite the same thing as saying um, taking ideas at that level and, and failing to look at the world-class ideas. Right. It's, it's two different categories. <clears throat> exactly, you know, and I think what you do is very global because what you talk about is uh, it's not about South African business, right? It's not about yeah. uh, the Gauteng <clears throat> area of local finance or whatever, right? That Absolutely what you do, not. your stories, everything like that is relatable on a global scale. Anybody mm -hmm. who listens to you can relate to what you're saying on a global scale anywhere in the world. I don't care if you're from New York, and that's York done intentionally, or, yeah, yeah. You know, Amsterdam or New York, wherever you are, right? And I think that's the thing. It needs to be general enough, but speaks to the person really that's listening to it. Did you always do that? Did you always go for that? 
Oh, thanks. Yeah, there are ways of doing that, and it's, it's actually fairly easy to do. You start with the very basic premise that every human being feels the basic range of emotions. We all feel fear, hope, love, joy, resentment. All of the basic feelings are very much universal. Then what I like to do, and I find this is, is such a simple but such a useful technique, um, taught by people like Steven Pinker, who's a cognitive psychologist and, right. and backed up by a few others. The, the simple notion is put your audience into that scenario as the main character. So if, for example, you're talking about a leadership challenge, you want to turn the person listening to you into the main character and say, imagine the scenario. You have a group of people and here's the goal you're trying to achieve. Now, here's the problem you're facing. This is the sense of fear that you feel. How do you proceed? How do you go forward? And what that does is it just gets the audience involved in living through the thing you're saying. It turns it from abstraction on a screen, and, and the worst version of that is a series of bullet points that talk about what problems leaders face, into a real-world scenario where you're saying, this is what you go through, and here's how you think. And those are universes apart. So it's just amazing to see that where you can go from where you were, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And most people, it's one of these, these best kept secrets. And I think it's such a shame. Most people are not aware that there is a world championships for public speaking. And uh, I think that's a, that's a great disservice to humanity. It's a fabulous thing. In fact, actually, earlier this year, Forbes magazine ran an article asking the simple question, what is the number one skill you can invest in to forward your career, to add value to, to grow, to become more financially independent? And they listed presentation skills number one. And they actually mentioned Toastmasters in the article. So I think we need to be promoting that link more powerfully. This idea that says, uh, as per Forbes magazine, if you want to advance in your career, if you want to earn more money, public speaking is the number one thing that you can do. Go join the Toastmasters Club. Would you say you would be as successful as you are with your business books and everything if you didn't have presentation skills? No, absolutely not. I started off with Toastmasters and presentation skills, and it also informs how I write, how I think, and so forth. So it's at the, the heart and soul of what I do. You give a lot of content away, absolutely free, gratis, no charge to it, right? Why? Why not just keep it to yourself? It's like, you know, if you want to, you can pay for this yeah. sort of a thing. I mean, like your that, videos, a, I, there's an extraordinary amount of information in your videos. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question because if you, if you think in terms of a speaker or, or author, our value is our IP. So why give it away for free? Well, the answer is it's also your very best marketing. Now, this brings us into this topic of positioning yourself as an expert on purpose. Unless you show the world what you're an expert in, what knowledge you have, how you can guide and help them and assist them to grow their lives, their businesses, their careers, they do not come to you for the implementation. Now, the fallacy is in thinking that if you give the information away for free, they will not come to you. It is the exact opposite of that is what actually happens. If you are writing articles, writing books, giving away ideas in videos, the people who spend money into your industry go, that's the person to talk to, bring them in, we have this expensive problem to solve. So your best IP is also your best marketing material. I, I advocate giving it away for free as much as you possibly can, and I don't see that as a problem. That's, that's how I built my career. That's just genius. So I was looking through your YouTube channel, and I mean, you've got YouTube, you've got videos up from eight years ago. You know, it's like, so you were like really one of the early adopters of the whole YouTube thing. Yeah. Having said that, I've, I've only really started taking YouTube very seriously over the course of the last year or so. And um, I, I had one video that was featured earlier this year that's had some three quarters of a million views. And most of that has been over the course of the last month. So it, it has taken a very long time and suddenly it's on a, on a strong upward trend. Um, I've taken on some new 25, 26,000 viewers over literally the last couple of weeks. So something is happening there and it, it, it appears to be working. But you know, I think the Lord's problem is that people think that they need to have a 20 <coughs> minute, 30 minute content for the videos. But you do these one minute, two minute uh, amateur to expert videos, you know, yeah. and <clears throat> because what you, you can boil it down to the, the core concepts and still bring enough value for it actually to be meaningful. But I think a lot of people get stuck because like, oh, I don't know if I have enough content for an hour or whatever. And it's like, maybe you don't need to. 
odd thing though. Sorry, I'm just uh, yeah, choking a little in the background. Yeah. <laughs> odd thing is that YouTube's own algorithms um, have worked out that the longer videos do tend to do a little better. Now, by longer, that does not have to be an hour at a time. Um, I think their recommendation is something like the, the six minute mark. They say that over six minutes actually attracts more viewership than under, which I found counterintuitive and surprising. I would have thought that the one to two minute clips would be much more attractive. Now, nevertheless, I do both. Um, I try and vary them. So my little daily videos on how to be an expert in your industry are typically between about a minute and a half to about four and a half, five minutes long. But every now and again, I try and put out one that's 20 minutes, half an hour, even an hour long. And to my own surprise, and in confirmation of what YouTube says, those seem to do extremely well. So I think it's, it's worth having a little bit of variety in there. Because I think the, the small videos lead you to the bigger videos, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, quite it's like, possibly. oh, this is what it gives in a minute? Imagine what it can give in six minutes. You know? Imagine, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think what happens as well is that YouTube, I mean, it very naturally filters people into sort of tribes and people who are interested in what you do. And if they're interested in what you do, they will watch an hour of it. So, you know, it's, it's not just that they're going, well, I'll, I'll tolerate this person for a minute. They found you because that's their area of interest. They, they will tolerate an hour from you if you have good value. And I think once again, and this is really the sort of theme of our, our conversation today, that keyword value is everything. If you go and look at some of the top earning YouTube stars, now th this is outside of the world of video game uh, celebrities and so on, it's not even necessarily about how well produced the videos are. Uh, in terms of, say, background studios and, and how well they're shot, often it's just two people sitting on a couch having a conversation. But the quality of the conversation is the thing that matters. Mm -hmm. So if there is a great deal of good content, great ideas, well put together, that can way outperform a well shot but glib video. But I think that's a wonderful way to end this conversation is to find a value and and run with it. Don't be afraid to undercharge for don't be afraid to to overcharge. We're not scrap that. Don't be afraid <laughs> to charge what you think is worth. And then what yeah. you think is worth, double it. Because honestly, usually it's people underestimate their, themselves a lot. The, the best financial advice I got, and in fact, it's the inscription at the beginning of Poverty Proof. It's to a friend of mine named Paul Dutois, who's a, a professional speaker right. in our industry. He's also CSP. He took me aside. Yeah, that, that, correct, yes. He took me aside one day and he said, Douglas, I, I, I want you to take your fee and double it. And my reaction to that, and it's always emotional, I said, ah, oh, Paul, if I do that, you know, plagues and locusts and I'll starve to death. And Paul said, you don't have to understand it. You don't even have to believe it. Just do it and watch it work. And I did, and it did. And for that, that was a profound lesson for me. It taught me several things, among which we get so wrapped up in our own emotions that we peg ourselves at a certain level. And if we can sweep our emotions out of the way and do a re-pegging exercise, we are often surprised. When I doubled my fee, my business went up, not down. And again, that teaches us something else interesting, which is that your perception of value is also tied to your pricing. Being too cheap is a problem for you. Well, actually, now that you said that, there's a story that I heard recently about Arnold Schwarzenegger when he first came to America and so forth, and he started this bricklaying business with a bunch of his bodybuilding yes. friends. And he charged rock bottom prices, right? And then he didn't get a phone call, nothing. Then later on, he rebranded, still the same people, still the same company, rebranded with like, you know, European bricklayers, the specialties, and then he charges yes. like double what the, the industry norm was, yes. right? And his phone rang off. It's something that, that has a French word in it, like say artiste. And artiste. With an e on the <laughs> a little oh, accent sure. here, yeah. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, you know, but I think that speaks a lot to what you do is own your industry, right? Be yeah. the go-to person for what yes. you do. And in fact, if I can just pick up on what you're saying there, the, yeah. the value of a name in terms of earnings, Stephen King, very famous idea uh, or famous story. When he started off, he wrote under two names, his own, which is Stephen King and Richard Bachman. Bachman right. He wrote a book called The Long Walk. And The Long Walk is vintage Stephen King. It's brilliant, but it tanked in the US market. The next year, they re-release the book under the name Stephen King, and it sells 10 times the number. Same book, same story, same market. The only difference was the name and the perceived value of the name. And, and therein lie a great many lessons. Yeah, well, I actually think he did the Richard Bachman books because I think he only wrote three books on the Richard Bachman, uh, one of which is Something The Running like Man, it, yeah. which is one of my favorite books. Uh, yeah. And it was, 
he wanted to test it actually i think uh he wanted to test yeah. if it was just people buying his books because of his name or the buying books yeah. because they actually enjoy the, the yeah. and the books were good enough that the buckman ones did enjoy a degree of success right. but it, it was disproportionate when republished under stephen king but there you have it you know it's like own your industry be the be the stephen king of 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 horror you know be the arnold schwarzenegger yeah. of movies or business or whatever you know it's like that guy's got degrees uh, in Absolutely, business yeah. and, and, and financing and stuff, you know, it's like, but I don't believe in a world where uh, degrees and stuff like that means a lot anymore. A lot of the, what the stuff is happening now uh, is plug and play, right? Yes. And even like IT that used to be like a very specialized field is now going away. Because a lot. Yeah, if you think of, of someone like um, Elon Musk, I mean, what you right. know, again, one of the world's wealthiest entrepreneurs, on and off, depending on how his fortune is doing that week. But uh, I mean, this is a man who who started off in the world of IT and then got into the world of, of literally rocket science. I mean, engineering rockets, and then after the fact, got himself a uh, a, a degree in engineering and and rocket science. But he started the business first. So, right. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's not about having the piece of paper. It is about raising your value. And that might mean, it might mean getting a university degree, but it might not. And in certain industries, spending three, four years getting the piece of paper assumes that you can waste three or four years of building a mm. business. And that may not be a smart move. Well, I mean, like, look, there are certain industries which I don't, I think actually you mentioned this on, on Facebook. Uh, if you're a surgeon and you don't have the necessary paperwork to back that up, thanks, but you're not, <laughs> not, you're not I mean, cutting it for me. You know, it's like, I love that. Um, yes. look, there are certain industries that you need to have that qualification yeah. because it does prove competence, right? Absolutely. But for most part, and I tell this story, it's like when Alexander the Great was dying on his deathbed and his generals gathered around him and asked, who are you going to leave the kingdom to? And he said, I'll leave it to the strongest. He didn't say, I'll leave it to the person who's got this degree, who's filled in Form 12B, <laughs> subsection C, yeah. and initialed here and there, and sub, you know, across yes. this. No, I leave it to the strongest, the person capable of doing it. And I think yeah. that's what we tend to lose focus on is, are you competent enough to actually do this job? Can you yes. own the industry? Can you actually succeed? And a lot of what I do training with, uh, especially younger people, is how to set you up, how to set yourself up to actually get the job that you want without worrying too much. And a lot of that has to do with social media because uh, companies, they look at your social media profiles, right? And if they can see this guy has got a series of videos on architecture, he's writing blogs on the fascinating architecture of this, um, he's doing all these studies and all kinds of things, that's the person who has got the enthusiasm and the drive to take my company. Yeah. And that's Absolutely. the person I want. Yeah, and and I'm taking a sort of a similar line of thinking. Often, if you have be, spent too much time in academia, you you start to think in those patterns, and those are not necessarily entrepreneurial patterns. And there again, that's why someone like an Elon Musk might be a better bet than someone with a, a master's in business. And and that really can be the case in the real world. We see it quite often. And like I said, Douglas gives away a lot of content for free. Please just connect with him and just watch his YouTube videos. You're going to see a lot of content and maybe that inspires you to move up in life and not just on with it. Douglas, thank you so much for this episode of Imagineering. I hope you really are just going out there and keep going what you're doing. But, Lovely. Thank okay. you so much. It's been great spending this morning with you and thanks so much for it. Cheers. Cheers. Take care.